Greetings and welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel. Today we are going to be doing a little craft project, actually a not so little craft project, that bounces off of an earlier video. Uh, a couple videos ago I showed taking apart a deer leg to use, as the old saying goes, everything but the oink. And we pulled a lot of stuff out of there, skin, sinew, hooves, etc. I'll put a link at the end of this video to that one if you want to see the, the setup for all of this. And over the last little bit of time, the last week and a half, I have been tanning these ankle skins. So this is the skin from the, the front hoof of a deer and this the back hoof. Okay, Nice white leather, nice soft, came out beautifully. So these were produced using the alum tanning method. Some people call it tawing, T-A-W-I-N-G. But it is a true tanning method. I'll argue it's a true tanning method. And it makes really nice white garment quality leather. So if you're interested in how I made these, follow along and I'll show you all of the steps that went into this beautiful project. So the status of these is that they were removed they were cleaned of all of the obvious little bits of meat and flesh, but not final fleshed. And they were dried with borax. And what you see here is the bits of borax powder that adhered to the flesh side of these hides. Now, the very first thing we need to do in order to start working toward our um, eventual tanning procedure is just to get them soft and flexible. So these are real crunchy and hard to work with. They're not going to absorb water readily when they're this super dry. And if you look in here at the base of these dew claws, there are some little bits of sinew and, and stuff hanging on there. And I need to get this borax off, get them cleaned and rinsed a little bit so that I can see if this is material that will tan or if this is material that will inhibit tanning or promote decomposition of the hide. So <clears throat> I need to get them soft and clean. But what, what I don't want to do is throw them in a bucket of water. When you're doing something that is going to be hair on, hair slippage is your biggest danger, your biggest risk of failure. And the longer that the hair remains wet, the more likely bacterial action is going to come in and cause that hair slippage. So how I'm going to rehydrate these is just put them on the pan, flip them all so that they're flesh side up, just kind of arrange them here, kind of being cantankerous. And then I'm going to take a cloth, which is, it's wet enough that if I were to, to wring it, I could get a few drops of water, but it's not dripping wet. And I'm just going to take this cloth and cover up these skins. Okay, so I want to rehydrate from the flesh side first and hair side last. And ultimately, I would prefer if the hair side remains pretty much entirely dry while the flesh side is moist enough that I can clean the borax powder out and do my final fleshing. So I'm just going to put these under this wet cloth and where I stash them? So that this doesn't dry out from the top, I'm just going to slide this little tray into a couple of plastic bags. I'm not going to tie them, thanks beloved, mm -hmm. I'm not going to tie them or make them completely airtight. I just want to keep a humid environment in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now I'm going to put this not in freezing conditions but just in a cool spot in the house. You don't want this where it's going to freeze, but you also don't want this right next to the fireplace because warmth is also your enemy because it will, again, enhance bacterial action and promote hair slippage. Okay, so this step is done. These are going to get set away overnight. Tomorrow, I will assess them. And as soon as they're moist enough to go on to the next step, I'll join you back and you can see what we're going to do. Welcome to tomorrow. These have been soaking with the little cloth on top of them for the better part of a day here. Not quite a full 24 hours. 
This morning I checked them and there were a couple of spots that were not fully rehydrated. Get rid of that. That were not fully rehydrated. So I just stretched them out, flattened them out a little bit, and then put the cloth back on them. And now you can see they're very, very nicely fully rehydrated. So before we get out our tanning chemicals, we want to go over these and look for anything that's still on them that could possibly interfere with the tanning process. We don't need to get rid of every last bit of borax and we don't need to get rid of you know every last tiny little little bit of sinew on the edges. But anything that's big and clumpy needs to be gone. Like this right here needs to go away. And that's very Let's see some of these some of these little tabs you can just pull up others need a little bit of coercion with the knife get that started you can see that just pulls away okay get that off of there everything you get off that's not going to be part of the finished piece is that much less of a chance of having the tanning process go badly. Now here's where I really need to look carefully. This is on the other side of those little dew claws. And there's some extra bits on here. It's not quite as obvious on this one as it is on this one, but that right there is the inside of the inner digital gland. That needs to go away. There's only a little bit of it on this one. Just take the tip of the knife and kind of scrape that off. Okay. Let's skin this one a little bit cleaner than that one. Look in around these little bones that are still attached. Make sure there's no fat pockets. A little bit of flesh there that I don't want. While you're doing this, make sure that you don't cut yourself. Yep. Or the yep. hide. Oh, I never cut myself. I've only done that once today. <laughs> Carving, not fleshing. Okay. That little bit off. Now, the biggest thing is that there's no fatty bits on it. Some of these little sinew pieces will just make that spot take a little bit longer. But if there's real fatty stuff on it, that will prevent it from tanning at all. You know, the little rotten spot in your hide. <coughs> there's a little thing I want to scrape off. over this I'm just going to talk a little bit about the tan that we're going to use. I'm going to use a mixture of borax and aluminum sulfate. When you're looking at skin, the composition of it, it's kind of a felt. The fibers in the felt are collagen and elastin. And then what holds the collagen and elastin together are glue-like proteins called glycoproteins. In order to tan the hide and get a nice soft finished product, we need to get rid of those glycoproteins by degrading them. In order to preserve the hide, we need to <coughs> permanently adhere preservatives to those collagen fibers and we need to cross-link those fibers together in a way that is flexible because we're getting rid of the glycoproteins that do that in nature. 
So you can get rid of the glycoproteins by treating them either with an acid or a base. When I'm doing a hair off hide, I will use a base because the base will degrade the hair follicles and make all of the hair fall off. So you can dehair and deal with the glycoproteins at the same time. But since I want to keep the fur on these little strips, I will not do that. So we will go with the acid option. It's part of what the aluminum sulfate is going to do for us. It will produce traces of sulfuric acid. Very, very mild, but still there. And that will help degrade the glycoproteins. And an acid pickle <coughs> shrinks the epidermis around the hair follicles. So it actually helps keep the hair on. If you're tanning, depending on what tanning solution you're using, you will often do an acid pickle as a pretreatment, which is just to preserve the hair. And then to work with the collagen fibers, you need a preservative that will bind to them permanently and cross-link them. That's what the aluminum three ions in our aluminum sulfate will do. So both components of this are active in the process. The sulfate will generate our acidity to preserve the hair. The aluminum <clears throat> is the tanning agent that will preserve the collagen fibers. At some point here I will do a chalk talk just on all the different tanning agents, but we're just going to leave it at that for this video. And since we have both the tanning agent and the acid production, we only need the one chemical. The borax is going to help open up the hide and help the, uh, it's a little soapy, so it will help open up the skin to let the tanning agent in and help cut through any little areas with some fatty residue so that they get preserved along with the rest of the hide. Okay, I think we've got that pretty good. Not seeing anything else obvious. Just take your time and go over it. Go over it carefully. I don't see any meat or any fat sticking to anything here. There's a little bit of membrane right there that I can't quite get off. This will go through that membrane. I've got this little tab that's just going to be cut off. That's not useful anyway. It's only going to be in the way. And that's right where that inner digital gland is. So that's just the membrane that was attaching the gland to the skin. That's how deer mark an area where they were scared. They stomp and it leaves inner digital scent. It tells other deer there's something scary here. If you ever spooked a deer and see them stomping before they run off, that's what they're doing. They're scent marking the ground in that spot. Okay. So this one is ready for the tanning solution. We're going to get a bowl. We're going to get our aluminum sulfate. Now, this is a garden product for lowering soil pH. This is one of the easier to find forms of aluminum sulfate. You'll, you can also find this as pickling alum. Alum is a very specific, very pure food grade form of aluminum sulfate, but any form of aluminum sulfate is useful in this process. You just need the aluminum ions and you need the source of acidity. Okay, and that source of acidity is why this is a good um, soil pH modifier. Now, we're mixing this just 50-50 with the borax and it doesn't have to be a perfect 50-50. Which is good because this is some clumpy old borax. Okay. Borax is an extraordinarily weak base, but a pretty good buffer. 
So in addition to opening up the hide, it's going to prevent that acidity from getting carried away and damaging things. Now I very much recommend that you wear gloves when you're messing with this stuff. Because as I'm sure you can guess, things that are good at turning skin into leather are not good for the moisture in your hands. So <laughs> I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend gloves for this process. Now I like to do as much as I can when I'm working with hides as a paste. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm just going to make a paste out of this. Just add a little water in. We want a, just a nice wet paste. Add a little bit more water. I put a little too, little more water than I want, so I'm just going to put a little more borax in there. There's lots of recipes for this, but it's not a real technical process. Close counts. If you use straight up alum without any buffering agent, you can end up with leather that tends to degrade over time <coughs> because you're going to get that acid, that acid buildup. Alum was used commonly in paper making through the 40s and 50s, which is why those old papers yellow so much. It's the acidity coming out of the alum. It's degrading those types of paper. So that buffering agent is just going to help prevent that. Now I'm just going to spoon the paste over, okay. spread her out. I like doing these sorts of processes with a paste more than immersion in a big vat of liquid solution because the cleanup is easier. One of the things you have to know about working with aluminum sulfate is that if you are on a rural septic tank of any sort and you get alum in there, it will cause all of the lovely material down in your septic tank to congeal into a giant stinky lump which you will then crawl down with a shovel and dig out. Yuck is a very good word. But when we're doing this with a paste, when we're done with this, we can just take this spoon and scrape it off, roll it up in a plastic bag and throw it away. So it's easy to dispose of. You also do not want to dump this anywhere you expect a plant to grow again ever. <laughs> right? It is water soluble. It will eventually wash through the system but not for a good long time. So you don't want to dump it on the ground. You don't want to have it in your septic tank. So working with powders and pastes is just an easier to dispose of form. You want to make sure you get this out all the way to the edges. And now I'm going to fold it up, flush side to flush side. Okay. This won't stain the hair. It doesn't matter if you get it a little gloppy. And we're just going to roll that up. And then this will go back in our plastic bag for a day. And we will check it tomorrow. Okay, it's two days later. Yesterday I unrolled these just to check on things and everything looked good. So I just rolled them back up. I didn't do anything mechanical. And now we're going to replace the original paste mix with a bit more of the same stuff and keep replenishing the tanning compound as we're, we're going through and letting them soak in it. You can see these skins are starting to lighten a little bit, which is good. And they, they look very nice and, and well fleshed. So I'm optimistic about this project. This one I just scraped clean. This one I'm about to. You can see how they're a little bit crusty and messy looking. So we want to get all of this old tanning paste off. I'm just going to take a spoon scrape it off. Just have a paper towel over here to receive it because again we don't want to dispose of this into a septic tank. That would be bad. 
a little from a rinsed washcloth that you use to wash the tables. Not going to be the end of the world, but we don't want to put any kind of large quantity in there. But this is part of why I like the, the paste tanning method. Because it's very easy to handle the waste. Also, these are thin skins. The thinner the skin, the easier it is to use a paste method. The thicker the skin, the more you need to have fully immerse it. On account of having to get material to soak in from both sides. Okay. So there's our, our hide. It's it's getting more even in color, a lot lighter. This does partially bleach the hide as we go along, and now I'm just doing more of the same. More of the same mixture. Made this a little bit too loose. That's okay. So once again, both sides are nicely coated with the paste. Now, this time I'm going to fold them together, flesh side to flesh side, and then roll them up that way. It's good to alternate the direction in which you roll these, because anytime you have a roll or a crease, it's going to want to you know, squish some of the paste away. And that can lead to little lines in your leather that don't take the tanning compound in thoroughly. So that's that little bundle. I'm going to go ahead and scrape and treat this little bundle. They look like they're doing nicely as well. And I'll do that off camera. And then we'll join again when there's some more to report on. So these are pretty much finished at this point with this step. How do I know that? Well, I just took these and scraped these. This is the, uh, what I'm scraping off now is the fourth edition of the paste of the skin. And if you look, first of all, they're starting to whiten nicely. Okay, they'll be a lot more white when we're all the way finished with them. But if I take the hide and give it a, I can do it without spilling my stuff, give it a stretch, you can see how it stretches and doesn't just spring back, okay? That's a sign that we've gotten rid of all of the, the, the rubbery material, the glycoproteins in the skin. And as I stretch it, it's getting whiter and whiter. Okay, that's all good. That's what we want to see in these. You know, if I kind of stretch it against my thumb here, it'll leave a little thumbprint depression. It won't just spring right back and, and act rubbery the way raw hide will, okay? So that's good. But then also, I cut off one of the ears on one of these just to look at the cross section. And it's an even color across the whole cross section. It's, it's, it's thin, it probably won't pick up well on the camera for you to see. But when I'm looking at this in person, you see all the way through, there's no color gradient. It's a consistent color all the way throughout, okay? Now, there can still be little patches that aren't all the way tanned. <clears throat> so on this little test piece, this end, where it kind of dried out a little bit more, that may or may not be all the way all the way tanned. But that stuff would get cut off anyway, these little uneven corners. So that's not a big deal. So what I'm doing now is just cleaning these. You're going to see when I clean them, there's also a difference in the material I'm scraping off. You see it's kind of runny. It's just completely running off. It's not 
a gooey material the way it was the first time I showed you scraping it off. I was kind of you know gooey, almost a little gelatinous. And now it's just runny and hardly even adhering to the hide. That means that the leather is no longer taking up the chemical. So I'm just doing the final clean in here. I think these were pretty much fully tanned after the third edition but I wanted to give it a little bit more time to see if there were any further changes in the structure of the skins and to make sure that some of the thicker parts like here around those dew cloths that I'm doing all this to try and save to make sure that the thicker parts were as tanned as the thinner parts You will hear some people call this tawing, T-A-W-I-N-G, when you're treating it with alum. Now here on the first side, you can see this has gotten wet with my mixture. I'm just going to try and scrape as much of that off. I don't want to scrape the hair off or damage the hair. I'm just kind of squeegeeing it. Anyway, tawing, T-A-W-I-N-G, and they'll say it's not a true tan. There's a little bit of truth in that. In the sense that if you soak these for a very long period of time, you can wash out <coughs> some of the aluminum. But I would argue it is a true tan because you still have a cross-linking action of the aluminum ions acting on the hair. I mean, on the, the collagen fibers, not there. They don't damage the hair. So I would argue it's a true tanning procedure. You do have a chemical reaction. This is, this is behaving like leather, not rawhide, all the way through. Okay. Final squeegee there. And then these need to be washed. They need to be washed very well. So over here, this is just a little pan with some sudsy water, just a little water and a little squeeze of dish soap. I did that off camera because my hands are unfit for touching the dish soap bottle in this condition. But I'm just gonna put these in here and let them soak overnight just to get cleaned up. And then we will do the final softening step. This one's ready to go, already did it. Okay. This one's ready to go. I already did it. Okay. Okay. So I've got this last one to scrape. And then we will move on to the leather dressing and softening. It's once again the next day. I left the hide soak in the sudsy water bath that I showed you in the previous clip. I left them soak overnight, and then I pulled them out. I rinsed them really, really well with tap water, squeezed them out, wrung them out, squeezed them out, all of that good stuff. Get them nice and clean. At this point, there's very little scent associated with them of any kind. You can still smell the, the hot gland is right here. So you can still smell that just a tiny bit, but it doesn't have any kind of real strong animal odor any longer. Uh, the interdigital scent, that's the little remnant scar of the interdigital gland that's totally gone so it's just a nice neat material after i washed it i set it out to dry eh, three four hours or so and you can see it's they're starting to get a little bit dry but when when i feel it i could it still feels cool and slightly moist okay now the next thing we're going to do is start the oiling process but we don't want it completely dry so that it can soak up the solution we're going to make well. We also don't want it completely sodden and wet or it's wet and it's not going to soak up the solution we're going to make at all. If you look at what we have, before I started drying it, it was like a real nice pure white. Now it's gotten a little bit darker just because it's drying and stiffening as it dries. 
but if I just give it a little stretch like that, you can see we get that nice white leather look coming back. But it won't soften yet. It is, it is tanned, it is fully tanned, but it won't soften without some oils in here to help spread and keep those leather fibers nice and loose and flexible relative to each other. It's still wet, so we don't want to just put pure oil on. I'm going to be using neat foot oil. The water that's still in there will partially repel the oil, so we need a water-soluble solution to get non-water-soluble oil into the hide. Catch-22. That brings us to emulsified oil solutions. Now, I like to keep things as natural and non-toxic as possible. Neat's foot oil is a natural animal based product, okay? But it's an oil. It's not <clears throat> emulsified. It won't get through the moisture that's still in those hides. The uh, natural emulsified oils available are one, brains, which is why brains are used for brain tanning. That'll be the topic of a different video. And two, egg yolk. Okay. And then a partial third is soap. Okay. So we're going to use the egg yolk and a little bit of soap as emulsifying agents for our neat's foot. And the neat's foot is going to be the real heavy lifter in the final solution. So I've got yolk of one egg here. I'm not going to need a whole lot of solution for these four little hides. I'm going to add just a tiny sprinkle of borax. Don't need a whole lot. The reason I'm putting some borax in here is twofold. The first reason is I want a little bit of residual buffering compound. And the second reason is I don't want to get buggy while it's working and drying. Um, borax is a nice natural insecticide. It keeps these from ever getting buggy. Now an egg is, oh, give or take a tablespoon, depending on how big your egg. So I'm going to add a tablespoon of meat's foot oil. Okay. And then, just to give it a little bit of, an, of, of a more oomph, and get it to emulsify a little bit of dish soap. I'm going to mix this up. I just need it to stay smooth. If it stays smooth, it's good. If it tries to separate, then you just put a little more dish soap in. But this is staying nice and smooth. Okay. Now, this is totally non-toxic, right? I don't, it's not gonna burn your skin. It's gonna moisturize your skin, if anything, okay? So I don't need to worry about gloves or any of that at this stage. I'm gonna take all four of my hides and I'm just gonna kind of divvy this up a little bit. Down there. And all that this entails is spooning it over spreading it out and rubbing it in a little bit. Mm. Just kind of massage it in a bit. We just want it to re-moisten and absorb this lovely mixture. I can feel just a little bit of grittiness from some of the borax that didn't dissolve. You can see it's starting to lighten again as it absorbs the moisture. Set that aside. Do the next one. This section didn't dry as much. You can see the color that we're looking at before it started to dry. Now, I'm planning to do a brain tanning video here. This is basically the same mixture I'll use for that, although in a different way. The process of applying it's going to be different. Okay. 
You see how this one's starting to lighten as it absorbs? Set that aside. I like using these natural materials, easy to dispose of, no worries, no concerns. You don't want borax in your garden in large quantity. It's, plants don't like it, except alfalfa. Alfalfa loves it for some reason. The rest of your plants don't like it. But it's, it'll give you a bellyache if you eat a lot, a lot, but other than that, it's non-toxic. And then I'm just going to give these half an hour, 45 minutes to absorb all of this lovely mixture. And then come back and give them a second coat of it. And then once they've had their second coat of it, I'm going to once again fold them flesh side to flesh side, roll them up, and put them away for the evening to absorb this overnight. And then tomorrow, we'll look at the softening process. So it is the next morning. We have had another um, overnight soak of these little hides in that oil solution, that oil mixture that I showed you in the previous clip. They have absorbed the majority of it, and they're right where we want them to be, where they're nice and relaxed, but they're not soaking wet in any way. That's exactly where we want it to be. Now, there's a little bit of residual on the surface that's going to make them hard to grip and hold as we start to do the final step, which is working them soft. So before doing that, I'm just going to take them. I just have some suzzy water. And I'm going to just kind of rub my fingers across the hair and the leather side and just kind of clean them a little bit. I don't want to soak them. If they are all the way wet, you can't work them soft. At any point in this process, if you run out of time or can't do something, you can just let them dry and then re-dampen them, or even just put them in the freezer, except for when you're softening. That has to be done all in one go. You have to get them right at this stage where they are where they are starting to transition from um, the really wet condition toward being surface dry and dry to the touch, but not too dry or they, they've already turned into rawhide. You know, we're, well, not rawhide anymore, but back to um, a really stiff material and too stiff to work. So that's, that's that, just uh, washing off some of the surface residue, get them nice and clean. I'm gonna pat them dry with a towel. And now this is where the hard work comes in. It's not gonna be too hard since these are small skins, but you start talking a big cow skin or even a full-size deer skin, this is a lot of work. And this is working them soft over a break. There's a lot of different ways that you can break the hide. Uh, some people, when they're doing hair off leather, will tie a cable or a rope to a tree and then pull it back and forth across the rope. Some will make a specialized um, stick and work it over a pointy stick. I just grabbed this convenient little cut off piece of, of wood and I'm going to take the hide, which you can see here, it's kind of kind of getting a little bit opaque. You can see some little white spots where it's a little damper. Mostly it's kind of gray color. It darkens as it dries. And it's in that you know sort of dark, two-thirds dry condition. Okay. And I'm going to put it flesh side down because I don't want to mess up the fur. And then just work it back and forth over the break. Okay. And you can see, starting to turn white, starting to soften. Now, you can also see you've got some stuff here that's kind of pilling up and rolling. Mm -hmm. That's the membrane. 
when these start to pill up and roll, just pick them off. They're not an important part of your leather. This is just the membrane that was connecting the skin to the muscle in the live animal. So as these little membrane pills form, you can just pick them off. And if there's any that cling tightly and they annoy you, at the end of the day when everything's all done, you can just take some sandpaper and smooth them down. Okay? If they don't annoy you, then they don't annoy you. right? So you can see here I have not done, here I have done. Um, you want to get good, even stretch on everything so you can you know, fold it and work it a little bit. You can work the other edge, you know, kind of fold it so it's edge to edge. Work that a little bit. Okay. It's easy to get the middles of the hide, it's harder to get the corners and the edges. So that middle section is pretty near done, right? And you can see it's got a nice, like I can pull a catty corner, you can kind of see it stretching. Mm -hmm. It's loosening up, okay, that's what we want. Now, as we get closer to the edges, it gets harder and harder to work. And this is where you kind of need to get creative with the pointy stick idea. See that, that that's working up nice. Stretch it in both directions as much as you can. It's hard on something this narrow. It's easy to stretch lengthwise. It's hard to stretch the width. right? Um, and then for the edges, I'm going to come to the, you know, kind of the pointy corners of the board. Put my hand, put tension and pull down and just kind of pull it off the corner. I know my hand's there, it won't work without my hand being there, but I'm just putting downward pressure here, pulling with all I can, so that I'm trying to stretch it against the groove there in this little piece of tongue and groove board. And that'll help it work out to the edges. <clears throat> So you can see how we're starting to turn white and get nice and soft there in the middle. But I haven't done the corners yet. So then you turn it and you do the same thing off the corners. You keep doing that. Once you've got it consistent and even, then you set it aside to dry for a half hour. And then when half of the moisture that's currently in it has gone out, you take it and you do it again. Same thing. Right? And then you let it dry all the way down and then you can do a final softening on the whole thing again and again and again. So you have to fully soften each of these about three times before they're all the way dry and then will stay soft. Now once they are, and this one is all the way dry, I did this one earlier so I could have a finished one to show you. They're real nice leather surface there. It's a nice light, nice light leather. Um, we want to put a final coating of oil. Can you hand me the Nice Foot Oil there, beloved? I can reach it. Okay, there we go. Forgot to bring this over when I started the clip. And just rub a little bit of the liquid oil into it all the way around. Just let it drink up as much of this as it wants. And now that you've spread all those fibers, it will drink a little bit more up. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're making a mess. I'm good at that. I'm trying to do this rapidly. It's always easier to make messes when you're on camera. And I did make one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you'll let this soak up and soak up all that oil. And then to work in the oil, what do you think we're going to do? We're going to take it to the break. We're going to do it again. Okay. So this is where the real work is 
all of this softening. Now, since these hides are so small, the, they go fairly quickly. Right? You do a full-sized hide, it's going to take a minute. Right? You're going to be at this you know, a whole day. Give yourself a good, solid day where you have nothing to do, but pay attention to the moisture content of your hide and work in it. Because if you let it dry too much, you won't be able to soften it. And it doesn't mean you lose the whole project. You just need to go put it back in a bucket of water, fully re-soak it, get it back to that partially dry, relaxed, but not all the way dry um, condition, and then start the softening process over. So you lose the hard work in your hard work step. <laughs> you don't lose your, your, your uh, sheet of leather. So um, you can see it's oil starting to work in now and, and get back to that nice white color. The oil will darken it some, that's normal. Um, you're seeing, what you're seeing when it darkens there is some of the pigmentation in the hairs being visible through the leather, that's what you're seeing. So that's normal. And you just keep doing this until it's as soft and fluffy as you want it. Different tanning processes will give you different softnesses of leather. So this alum tan is a fairly soft leather. It's often used as kind of a buckskin substitute. Uh, veg tan, where you're using tannic acid, is considerably harder and won't get nearly as soft. This process is often used in conjunction with other processes. So one of the characteristics of alum tanned leather is that it's very, very porous. So if you want to do another process after the fact, doing this first will open up the weave of the weather, open up leather, you know, it's like a protein felt. It will open up those fibers. And then whatever process you're gonna do for the final process goes faster. So this tying, it, it, is often done as an intermediate step when you're doing other kinds of tanning. So it can be used in conjunction with things. This will, oh, I put it in a, more oil than I wanted on that section. <laughs> the dangers of filming while you're working. Um, this is not fully waterproof and it will stiffen up quite a bit if you get it wet and then let it dry. So this is not a washable, waterproof leather. That's not where you want this. This is more you know, like fur hat, gloves, tool sheath, something like that, where you're not going to expect it to go in the water all the time. This is not a boot leather type process. Um, I have heard people take this and smoke it like a rawhide. And I've heard that that can um, help it recover from having been wetted. I have not done that experiment myself. It is something I intend to try at some point here in the future, but for what it's worth, I've heard of that. I haven't tested it myself, so I don't really know if that's true or not. It's, it makes me curious enough, I wanna try it, but I don't know for sure whether that will work or not, but it's something you can experiment <laughs> with. If you've done that and experimented with it, pop a comment down in the comment section below. I'd love to see what your observations are. We can all share and, and learn from each other here. That's, that's a wonderful, awesome thing. So we have a finished product. This took me about a week and a half all in. And if you have enjoyed this and if you like this, I'd love if you give the, the video a thumbs up. It helps the YouTube algorithm know to, know to show it to others. And I'm very grateful when you do that. And I will see you next time here at Old Ways Rising Farm.